guys. I welcome you to another podcast lesson on how to use finite element procedure to solve um, static structural engineering problem. In my last video, I solved um, this um, one-dimensional structural problem using the finite element procedure by elimination method. We use our MATLAB as our working tool and we got some results. We got some solution. In that same video, I also did an I also did an I also did a hand calculation on on this same problem. So we compared the final element solution with the hand calculation. We found that we found that the final element solution using uh, one using two one dimensional finite elements gives a that um, solution to the hand um, calculation. In this video, I'm going to solve um, the same problem using the finite element procedure, but we are going to apply um, the penalty method approach um, to solve this problem. After I solve this problem using the um, penalty uh, method approach on MATLAB, we move to the ANSYS on working uh, environment. We use the ANSYS program to solve, solve this problem. I'm going to show you how to use how to um, how to model this uh, one-dimensional structural problem on ANSYS. Um, before I continue, I would like to inform um, you guys that if you are a student at a university, um, you can use your student mail to get access to the original um, software version of ANSYS program and MATLAB. You just need to register on their website with your student mail, and um, you and they will grant you access um, and to their um, academic version software. So I I encourage all of you guys to take advantage of this opportunity. Um, so we want to solve um, this problem using the final element um, procedure by penalty method. So let me quickly give an overview of um, the problem statement. We have um, um, two uh, material parts, uh, material part one and two, um, labeled by the um, numbers in the triangle, which which um, are joined at um, node two. And the, the structural body, that is the material one and material two, um, there is a support at node one, and there is a point load at uh, node three. So uh, to solve this problem using the finite element um, procedure, the material one, the, um, the, the geometric and the material property includes um, the cross-sectional area given by A1 equals to 50 uh, millimeter per second, <laughs> given by 50 millimeter square. The E1 uh, is uh, the young modulus of material one and uh, given as um, 200 kilopascal. And same thing for the material two. And um, I want to point out something here. Uh, the cross-sectional um, area of um, each of the material is a, is a square. Um, so you can see the section one, one, and section two, two. Uh, this denoting a square. Section two, two also denoting a square. So even um, the, if, um, the cross-sectional area, of, if the cross-sectional shape of the um, materials are square, that means, um, like material one, um, the 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 length of the of the mat the length and width of the material is equals to um, the square root of fifty. Why the uh, length and width of material two? The, the the length and width the length and that and the length and width of um, material two uh, is equals to the square root of hundred, which is ten ten mm. And the length of material one is um, 90 mm, while the length of material two is um, 120 mm. So what we want to use um, the finite um, element procedure um, to solve um, to solve this um, problem. So I'll move on to the next slide now. Um, before I continue, I would like to activate my pen to point out um, some salient um, po points. Okay, um, as explained in my introduction video, the first video, I stated that in order to uh, modify um, the global stiffness matrix K, 
uh, using the final element procedure, we need to add a large stiffness to the support um, degree of freedom. And to the force vector, we need to add um, C multiplied by A to the node to the uh, node number of the support degree of freedom. For our structural problem, since our structural problem has three nodes, that means our global stiffness matrix is a three by three matrix. And since um, we have just one support in our structural problem at node one, it means that the last stiffness will be added at position one one of the global stiffness matrix. So that's why C is added to this position. If, I, if, there, if there was a support at um, node three, that means in my global stiffness matrix, I'm also going to add C uh, to this value. So because we have just one support degree of freedom, so we add a large stiffness to the to position uh, one one in the global stiffness matrix. And in the false, um, for in the false um, vector, we also add a quantity to uh, to the position one of the, of the force um, vector. We add um, C multiplied by A. A is um, like the gap between um, the support and your node. As I explained this in my previous um, video, the initial gap between the support and the node. Uh, in our problem, in our structural problem, we don't have any gap problem before the structural law was applied. So our A is zero. So because our A is zero, that means we are not adding anything to the position one of this uh, force vector. The only modification is to add C to the global stiffness uh, vector. So after we have modified the global stiffness uh, matrix and the force vector, we can now invert, we can now calculate, compute, um, we can now compute the displacement vector by inverting um, the modified stiffness matrix and multiplying by and the fault vector. So this will give us the global stiffness uh, matrix. So this is the penalty approach. And also, one advantage of using the penalty approach is that you, there is a formula we can use to calculate um, the reaction at the support. In the elimination method, there is no any formula, there is no any final element formula we use to um, we can use to determine the reaction as support. But in the penalty uh, method, you can use this formula to um, determine the reaction at all your supports. In our problem, we have um, a support at uh, node one. So the formula is given by minus C multiplied by the um, displacement quantity at node one. That is this Q1 is calculated minus A1. A1 is zero because there is not, we don't have initial gap in our problem. So the formula reduces to minus C times Q1. Q1 actually is supposed to give us zero because we know that uh, this is a support. But using the penalty approach, you will find, we will find out that Q gives Q1 is a very, very, very small value, like 0 0.0000001. It shows you that um, the finite element procedure is an approximate method, as I told you. And it gives very, very close answer to the, um, to the exact solution. So that 0 0.0001, that's what we put as our Q1 here, yeah? and we'll multiply by our C. So we multiply the two quantities together, you get the reaction at support one. I'm going to explain this procedure in the MATLAB working environment. So after we have solved this problem in the MATLAB working environment using the penalty method, we will move to um, the ANSYS finite element program where we'll solve the problem. I, I, I've actually done this uh, before this video. So this is the deformation uh, color plot di diagram for the um, problem. And you, you can see that um, at the at node one we have zero mm deformation. At uh, node two we have one point four four mm, and at node three we have um, two point four mm. At intermediate points um, between the nodes, you can also uh, get values of of the uh, 
You can also get value of, of, of deformation. Say somewhere at the midpoint of element one, the deformation is at 0 0.7468. Somewhere at the midpoint of element two, the deformation is at 1.8361. I'm going to show you how to uh, model this problem in the ANSYS and working environment. Um, now we move to the uh, MATLAB working environment. Um, now we are on the MATLAB working environment. Um, similar to um, the lesson of um, my previous uh, video, uh, where I use a live script um, to solve um, the, to solve the problem by elimination method, I've also written a live script um, by the penalty method. So this is the live script here. And actually, um, for most part of um, this code, is similar to the emission method. So I'll just give a quick summary to the point where both the emission method and the penalty method are similar. So I'll, I'll quickly go through it to that point now. So we have our problem, two, two bodies joined together at node two. There is a support at node one, um, a point load at node three, um, 160 kilo newton, the area and uh, the geometric and, uh, and material property given by A1, E1, A2, E2, length is 90 mm for the four element one, and the length of, uh, of material two is um, 120 mm. So the first thing we need to do, I say, is to um, define our finite element model. So two, two elements, two, two one dimensional linear elements, one and two defined. The node numbering for, we have three nodes, node one, node two, node three, three degree of freedom in the horizontal, horizontal direction, Q1, Q2, Q3. So this is the first step in all finite um, element procedure. You need to define your model, your, you need to define your finite element model. So we, after you have done that, we enter our material, we, we store our, we enter our, we store our, um, Geometric and material property E1, E1, L1 for um, element one in MATLAB. So I enter I, this code does that E1 my young modulus E1 equals to 200. With my young modulus, which is um 200 kilopascal, so I entered it here as um 200 times 10 to so 3 newton per millimeter square. My length 90 mm. Length of element one is 90 mm. Um, the cross-sectional area of, ele of element one is around um, 50 mm. So I've entered this value, and the value gets stored in MATLAB. You can see E1, L1, A1 written below the MATLAB code. The same thing is done to element the is done to the finite element two. E2 is entered, L2 is entered, A2 is entered, and the value is stored um, in the MATLAB uh, memory. So after you have defined after you have defined the um, geometric and the material property, the next thing you need to do is to um, define your local stiffness matrix for each element. So for if and the formula is given by this, this is the formula for a one-dimensional linear linear um, finite element. So we can use our material property. Uh, and geometric property to um, define K1. So you use this MATLAB code and K1 is given. K1 is the local stiffness matrix, local stiffness matrix of element one. And like uh, at position one, at position uh, one comma one of this matrix, the value is 1.111 times 10 to the power five. Newton per millimeter, Newton per millimeter. The same thing is done for um, local stiffness matrix of element two. We use the um, the geometric and the material property that we've already stored in MATLAB to calculate K2. E2, A2 divided by L2 times, the, times, this, um, um, times this matrix. So when, when that is done, um, the K2 matrix is um, calculated and stored in the MATLAB uh, memory. So after we have um, defined our local stiffness matrix for all the elements, all our elements is just element one and element two. So we need to assemble this local stiffness matrix into a global stiffness matrix. So I have a procedure which I use to um, assemble the global stiffness matrix. The first thing you need to do is to 
define a base matrix. That base matrix is a zero matrix. So because our final element model has three nodes, the size of our global stiffness matrix will be a three by three matrix. So our base matrix, which is a zero matrix, will be a three by three matrix, which I've defined here. This have a zero, have a three by three zero matrix here. And this matrix is um, is formed using this uh, MATLAB code. Zeros is, a, is an inbuilt uh, MATLAB function. It's an inbuilt MATLAB function, which, which is used to uh, generate uh, um, metric, zero metrics of any size. So this is how you, um, this is how I create uh, my zero metrics. This three denotes the size of the metrics, three by three. So after you have defined this metrics, we need to add our local stiffness. We need to assemble the local stiffness metrics into the, into the global stiffness metrics. So element one, because element one is located between node one and node two, so we write our MATLAB code in this form. So I'm adding K1 in this position in the zero, zero metrics, in, in position one, one, position two, two, position two, one, and position two, two. And this actually, what is in this bracket, I, I just want to quickly explain it. I explained this in my previous video. Um, this, this, this one column two means from, from along the row from one to two. And this, the other one uh, column two means along the column from one to two. I want to write K1 in that position. So I write this on the left hand side. I also write this on the right hand side and I add K1 to it. So once I execute this MATLAB code by clicking run, K1 gets added in the four position which I showed earlier on. So this is the operation. What is here? This is the operation of um, this MATLAB code. So the same thing is done to K2. K2 is added at uh, position two and three of, um, the, of, of the global stiffness matrix along the rows and column. So when, once I run this code, um, this is formed. So this is how we assemble our um, global stiffness matrix uh, for our structural problem. So after we have assembled our global stiffness matrix, and this is where the difference between the elimination method and the and the penalty method, uh, this, is when the, this is where there is a difference. So we are not eliminating rows and columns as we did in the elimination method. What we do, as I, I, I explained uh, some minutes ago, we add a last stiffness at um, at this position, at one comma one, and that last stiffness, I explained, I I I, I introduced this in my introduction video, my fourth video. I said the last the last stiffness is defined as the largest um, element in the global stiffness matrix multiplied by 10,000. In this global stiffness matrix, the largest element is, um, is this value here, 2.778 times 10 to the power 5. So this value times 10,000 is my C, and I define it uh, using this MATLAB code. There's an inbuilt caution, there's an inbuilt function in MATLAB called uh, max. So I'm using that max to select um, the maximum value in the global stiffness matrix. If, so this, this max function is this max function is an inbuilt function. So if I should input my k matrix in this form in it as an input variable, it um, captures this value here, 2.778, and then I multiply the value by 10,000. So I have defined my c. So once I run this code, my c is defined, and c is called, you can see that c is equals to 2.778 times 10 is 9. So what I need to do, I need to add this c to the to this position in the global stiffness matrix, to this position. And I do this using this um, line of code. So I say uh, uh, for the K matrix at position one, at position one comma one, add C. I write this here, I write this here, and I add C to it. So you should add C to this, if you add C to, to this value, this is formed. So this is our modified, um, global stiffness matrix. So after doing this, you also need to modify the global force vector. But because we don't have initial gap problem, A is zero. 
So actually, we don't actually need to modify um, the the we don't actually yeah we don't actually need to modify the global force vector. So if if a was a value, I would have um, calculated c times a the a value, and I, I would have added it uh, to this first position here. Yeah, here will not be zero. Here will be c. Here will be c um, times a. So my first vector is given by this. We only have one load in the structural model. That is at node three, and the load is at one hundred and sixty um, kilonewton. But I'm working in newton, so one hundred and sixty thousand newton. Let me show you the structural model. So this is structural model at node one and node two. There is no any load, so zero at node three, one hundred and sixty kilonewton. So that's why this is defined as um, this. So I define f as this, and I run the code. Uh, so I've defined my global force vector. So now, after I've defined my global force vector and my global and my modified uh, global stiffness matrix, I can calculate my global displacement vector. You just need to invert uh, the global stiffness matrix and multiply it by f. So once you do that, once you do that, um, you. You, you, uh, the global stiffness vector is um, calculated. You see at uh, node 1, the displacement is 0 0.001. At node 2, the displacement is 1.4401. And at node 3, the displacement is 2.4001. Compared with our ANC calculation, we know that at position 1, there is support. So the displacement is supposed to be 0. But we are getting a very, very small value, 0.0001. This shows that the finite element procedure is an approximate method, as I've said. And at position two, in which our um, deformation is 1.44, for, um, from our ANC calculation, we are getting 1.4401. At position three, where our, in our, in our ANC calculation, the deformation is 2.4, we are getting 2.4001 mm. You can see the finite element method is an approximate solution to the actual result. But it gives very, very, very good results. So this is how uh, we use a penalty method to uh, determine the uh, displacement uh, vector for a one-dimensional problem. So the same, in the same fashion, just like in the elimination method, we can use uh, this formula here to determine the normal stress in each element. So the normal stress is given by the Young modulus divided by L times this uh, one, this matrix times this uh, displacement uh, vector. This real vector, the first quantity here is the displacement at the initial node, node one, and the Q2 is the uh, displacement at the second node, the end node, node two. So I calculate this stress in the in element one. I denote it as um, sigma one. So I'm using the area property which I already defined E1, E1, which is um, 200, um, 200,000 newton per millimeter square. A, A1, which is 90 mm, multiplied by this matrix, multiplied by this. Here I'm extracting, um, I'm extracting these values here, these two values, Q1 and Q2, because Q1 is my uh, displacement of uh, is, is displacement of my of at node one for my element one and Q2 is the is my is the displacement at node two for my element one. So I, I need this true displacement value to determine the stress in the member. So I extract it with uh, this uh, Q code. Q is um, like what I use to define the displacement, the global displacement vector. So you just need to open bracket and extract what uses to extract what you want. So the normal stress is given by 3,200 um, um, Newton per millimeter square or 3,200 megapascal. The same thing is done for element two, but this time I because uh, because element two is between node two and node three, I need um, I need these two values, the displacement at node two and node three. So I extracted it um, using this uh, 
code. So sigma 2 is given as a 1600 megapascal. I told you in, um, one advantage of using the penalty method is that you can compose the reaction from the um, with the displacement quantity at the support. So I'm using this formula to compute the reaction at node 1 where the support is located. So minus C, C is already calculated, 2.7778 times S19 times the displacement at where at the position where the, where the support is located, that is at node 1. So Q is my global displacement vector, and I need this value here, just this value, 0 0.001. So I put um, the value here. So this extracts the value of um, of the of, uh, of the value at uh, position one. So once it's multiplied, the a is um, zero because there's no initial gap. I've explained this several times. So once you multiply this um, reaction, the reaction gets computed as a minus one point uh, minus one point six times ten to the power five um, newton, which is in opposite direction to the um, apply force at node three. You can see. Uh, the finite element procedure is, is a very is is an is a very efficient um, uh, method uh, for solving a structural structural for one for, for solving one dimension structural problem. So this is a um, penalty method um, using finite element um, procedure for one dimensional problem. Um, now we move to the um, ANSYS and working environment. Uh, so, how you open um, the ANSYS um, working environment from your desktop, you need to search for Workbench here yeah. in your Windows search. Type Workbench and you click on Workbench. I'm using Workbench 12 and 21 out to. That's what I normally use for my ANSYS program. So I click on it. It will take some time for it to come on. Um, here we are at um, the ANSYS workbench and work environment. Um, in this work environment, um, you will see several analysis server on the left hand side of um, the screen uh, used to solve um, several problems. This shows you or tells you how powerful the ANSYS uh, software is. The ANSYS program is not just for solving static problems, you can also use it, use it to, to, uh, to solve a um, dynamic problem can use it in a fluid analysis, in electrical science, different field of study um, uses um, ANSYS. So for our one dimensional problem, to solve our one dimensional problem, we are using um, the static structural solver. So I'm going to click on it and I will select it and I will drag and drop at the middle of the screen. This takes some time for it to load. So this is the static um, structural solver, which we are going to use um, to solve our one-dimensional problem. To kickstart, the first thing you might like to do, you might like to um, um, why say label your st static structural solver. Like if here is written static structure, I can say um, I can I can change the this name, this um, title here, the name, and say, uh, say one dimension, one one D um, finite element analysis, finite element analysis. Can can name it anything you want to name it. You okay? So. Um, what we need to do is that we need to go through um, this workflow from the engineering data to the geometry to the model to the setup to the solution to the results. 
So the engineering property of our material is defined in the engineering data. So to go to the engineering data, you can either double click on this uh, engineering data or you right click, a window opens and you click on edit. Um, so this is where we define our material property, which is um, the young modulus E. So what I'm going to do here, um, you need to do more research on how this um, interface work. I'm only going to go straight to the point. I'm going to create a new material. Uh, to create a new material, you click on this role here, asterisk. You can name the material, give it any name. I will name my material steel. Steel. So the material has been created and the name of the material is steel. So under the material, actually there is, there is no any uh, engineering property in it. How do we know this? Because under the property of outline, this property um, table here, it is blank, it is empty. To add a new property to the, uh, to this, to the new material we just created, we, um, we can drag, these are different properties which you can add to our material. So we can drag any of this material, any of these properties, say density, we we'll add it to our new, our steel, uh, our new material, which is called steel. So I can add steel to steel, and I can, I can add density to steel, density property to steel, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to add um, a, an elastic property called um, isotropic elasticity. So I'll click on it, and I will drag and select it, and I'll drop it on um, the new material which I created, which is steel. So once you do that, um, this um, table, the, the part under the part, uh, property of outline, a table gets um, created. And the table, you will see that you need to define your young modulus in row five and your portion ratio for the new for the new materials for the new materials still you just created. In ANSYS, for static structure, you you need to define at least two um, material property, which is um, the young modulus or the portion ratio. If I don't if I don't define the portion ratio. Uh, MATLAB will not, I won't be able to analyze any results uh, um, on this um, Antla, on, on this, uh, on this um, ANSYS um, program. So for this problem, I'm going to assume a portion ratio of um, 0 0.3. Actually, assuming a portion ratio will not affect um, the accuracy of our results. And we shall see this, we shall see this when we get solution from the ANSI software and we compare with and with, and we compare it with our AN calculation we shall see that um, the ANSI result is is the same with the AN calculation so for the portion ratio I, as i have said i will define it as a 0.3 for the young modulus that is our e value is um, 200 gigapascal so because i want to enter the value in the gigapascal I need to change the units of a young modulus. Currently at Pascal, I'll change to gigapascal, and I'll enter 200 here. Yeah. So now I've defined a, an engineering material on the on the engineering data um, work environment. So I can close this tab now. So now we are done with um, the row two. We move to row three. That is the geometry. Uh, so now I'll click on the um, geometric uh, workflow. When I click on it, um, you'll see this um, table on my right hand side. You need to edit um, some parameter here. I want to point out uh, some things to you um, in this table. Under analysis, under the analysis um, type, you will see 3D, 2D. You don't see 1D. It tells you that ANSYS is not built to solve one-dimensional problem. But because you have good understanding of the first principle, you can trick ANSYS to solve a one-dimensional problem. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to leave it as a, as a 3D type analysis, and I'm going to 
we use the 3D uh, analysis type, so a one dimension analysis type. I will show you how you do this uh, um, in this lesson. Also, I need to check um, this line body. The elements we are using, uh, our finite element in ANSYS is uh, for one dimension is called line body. So you need to check this so you'll be able to use this when you are defining a geometry um, in, in a place called space claim. I'm going to explain and that uh, to you shortly. So this is what you need to do. You need to check, um, what you need to do here, you need for one dimension analysis, you need to make sure this line body is checked. So after you have done this, I'll go back to my geometry works, uh, work, uh, work, workflow. I will right click on it. When, once I uh, right click on it, um, this, um, this comes, this pops up. In defining your geometry in ANSYS, there are two method of there are two um, geometric uh, work environment for defining geometry. We have a space claim, and we have the design and uh, design mod modeler. In this lesson, I am using a um, space claim um, geometry uh, work environment to um, define my geometry. So I'll click on a new space claim and geometry. This takes some time. Now we are in this uh, space claim um, um, geometric uh, work. Uh, the, the, the space we're in the space claim uh, work environment. Um, in this work environment, this is where we define our geometry. And our geometry can be any kind. It can be like one-dimensional elements, line, just drawing lines. It can be frame elements. It can be beam. We can draw our, we can draw frame here and uh, frame as our geometry. We can draw beams as our geometry. We can draw the uh, two uh, D elements as our geometry. We can even draw three D uh, objects um, in this three um, D drawing environment. We can sketch anything here, and uh, we can. Use the geometry. We can use it, we can use that geometry in our in a, in any in a, in say in 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 a server like um, the static structure um, server. So um, first, what what we need um, to sketch our model, we need to um, draw a line. We need to sketch a line. So before doing this, I need to set the plane in which I want to um, draw. This, this is like a 3D, I, I don't want to draw in a 3, 3D, um, in a 3D view. I want to draw in a plane. So to do that, you click on this button here, sketch a new, select a new sketch plane. So I can select X, the XY plane. I can select um, the YZ plane. As I'm moving my cursor, you can see the plane is changing. You can also select an um, XZ plane. But in this um, lesson, I want to use the XY plane. So once the I can once I see the XY plane, I will click my I'll left click my mouse to select it. So this is the XY plane. This is the plane I want to draw. So I can click on um, this to bring the plane in view in plan view. I click on it, you can see it's now in plan view. So now I'm going to sketch my one dimensional element, like my line element, using the line, this line command. So I'll click on the line command, and I will, um, I will start my drawing from the, from the zero coordinates, S equals to zero, Y equals to zero. So from here, I will start my drawing. So I've, I've, I've clicked on that point. So my, the length of my first element, is a 90 mm. So I'll enter 90 mm in my length dimension, 90 mm. And I'll, I will uh, press enter on my keyboard. So this is what happens when I did that. I zoom in, 
zoom out. So I've I've created my I've created a line of length of length 90 mm. Um, I'll create another uh, line from that from the end point 120 mm because that is the length of my second uh, finite element. Enter 120 and I'll press enter. So now, now um, you um, press escape on your keyboard to leave the line command and um, you click on end sketch editing to also leave the sketch um, command. So I've created my um, two elements. Element 1, which is 90 mm, and element 2, which is uh, 120 mm. Uh, so let me bring it to proper view. Um, the next step is to um, define the cross-sectional area of each of our elements. And to do this, we need to go to the prepare tab, which is at, at the top here. So I click on the prepare tab. So under the beam panel here, you go to the profile and you create a new profile. Because I have um, two area cross section, I'm going to click on um, this. Um, I'm going to create. I'm going to create um, two profile. I'm going to create um, two rectangular profile because I have um, two. Uh, I have two cross section in my model, so I'll click on it now. I'm using a rectangular profile because that's what was specified um, in my model that um, the cross section is a square. So I'll click on this. So once you click on it, something happens. A new folder is created here called um, beam profile. And if I should, if you should open the new prof the, the beam profile, you will see the cross section I am created. I, I will create an under section because I need two uh, profile, I need two cross section. So I'll, I'll go back to that profile and I will click on the rectangular button again to create another to create another new section. So a new section name and triangle two um, has been formed. I can rename triangle triangle two if I like, but I don't feel like I'm renaming it. Uh, but what you need to do, you need to change the dimension of the of the rectangle, the default dimension, to fit. Um, what was specified in the question. So I'll click on rectangle one, I will right click, and I'll click on edit um, beam profile. So once you click on that, um, this interface pops up. You can see our our rectangular cross section, the, the, the length and the width is uh, 10 mm, defined, defined by B and H, 10 mm. I can change this dimension from here. You see B and H here. So, so if, I, if I click select B and I click on this 10 mm, I can this I would I can change the value. Um, I need to change this B uh, this B value. This um, cross section is um, the cross section area is um, 50 mm square. So the B and H will be um, square root of 50. And I'll do the calculation now with my calculator. 50 square root, 7.07116, blah, blah, blah. So I'll select it. I will copy. And I will paste in this position. I press Enter on my keyboard. So I've changed the dimension of B. I'll do the same thing for H. I will paste, press enter on my keyboard. So this, so I've changed the two dimension to um, 7.07 .07 mm. So after, yeah, after I've changed the dimension of the length and width of, after I've changed the length and width of my, of the, of the, of this, um, of this shape, I can now close, um, can now close uh, this um, tab. This like a window. You can close it. So I've closed it. You need to click on the structure tab, 
go back to your beam profile. Also, the rectangle tool, you need to change the dimension of the uh, beam profile. So I'll right click on it, click on edit uh, beam profile. Luckily, our dimension is 10 mm, 10 mm. The cross section area of the second, our second cross section area is um, 100 mm square, and the square root of 100 is 10. So our B is 10, our H is 10. So I don't need to change this dimension. So I'll close um, this tab. So now we have um, defined our beam profile. So what we need to do, we need to apply this beam profile on our sketch line. So to do that, you will select one of the beam profiles, say the rectangle, and you click under the under prepare tab, um, tab the beam panel, create. You click on create. So when you click on create, you can apply and you select um, a, a beam profile. You select um, each of the elements to apply the cross section which you want to apply. So I, I, I want to apply the rectangle beam profile to this first element. I'll click on it. So it takes some time for it to apply. I'm not responding. Laptop is slow. So once I once the cross section is applied, you will notice something change here. A new folder is formed called beams. So a beam element is formed because I applied my beam profile to the line sketch. I'll do the same thing to the second. I will um, select. Um, I will select um, the second line sketch and I will apply the rectangle too. But something happens here that I don't understand. Um, ANSYS apply rectangle, uh, rectangle two to my both beams and I, that was not my intention. I only wanted to apply um, the rectangle beam profile to the first um, to the to, to the first element and rectangle two to the second element. So what you need to do, um, click on escape to leave this um, create and beam um, function. I, I click on escape. So I've, I've left the uh, beam, the create beam function. So if you should select the beam, you can change the profile. Yeah, just below, under the profile name. I change the profile from rectangle two to rectangle. Remember, the rectangle is um, my 50 mm square. Rectangle 2 is the way it's supposed to be. So going back to the first um, beam created again, I also need to change um, the type of element. Currently, um, the element is defined as a beam type. Um, so this is actually a 3D beam structural element. So we need to change it. Um, to a link type element. So if I, if I click on this down arrow, so I click on um, link or source. So changing it from a beam to a link type element actually reduces the dimension of my analysis. It reduces the dimension from a 3D beam, and beam element to a 2D plain, plain truss element. So this is what is going on here. So this, selecting this, changing this to like truss reduces um, the analysis to a 2D analysis. But we still need to go one step lower, um, reducing the dimension to a one dimensional element. Um, we also need to change the beam type for second element. So you click on beam and beam uh, rectangle two, and you click on the down arrow, click link or source. Um, so what does it mean to define our element again as a um, link or source in analysis? I will explain this uh, on PowerPoint. Um, so here is a sketch of a 2D source finite element um, model. 
you can see at each node, each node is defined by two degree of freedom. A degree of freedom in the horizontal direction, global in the horizontal global direction, and in the vertical global direction. One, two. The second node also has a um, two degree of freedom, three and four. So that means our, this node can move can move horizontally or vertically. Node one can move horizontally uh, or vertically. Even and also node two can also move um, can also move um, horizontally or vertically. So, but what we need to do, I need to, okay, I need to restrict um, this movement, um, this vertical movement, this degree of freedom two and this degree of freedom four. For one dimensional analysis, I only need one degree of freedom at each node. That is degree of freedom one and degree of freedom three. So, I'm going to show you how to eliminate this vertical degree of freedom in the ANSYS software. So this is what we mean when we say um, an element is in one dimension. That means it can only move in one dimension. So I'm, I'm going to show you how we knock, knock off um, the vertical degree of freedom. Now we move, uh, we go back to the ANSYS um, uh, space claim. Um, now we have defined our two elements uh, in the space claim working environment. But before we leave this working environment, there's one more thing we need to do, which is actually very important. But I don't actually know why it's important. But if, if you don't specify it, you will not be able to get results for this analysis. It's very, very important. So you need to click on this design button here. And on that design button, this chair topology, you need to share topology. You need to select share topology. It's very important. I don't know why it's important, but you, need, you must select it. If you don't select it, you will just be getting error, 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 error. You don't know what you 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 you, you will not know what is going on, and you'll be frustrated. So you need to share topology. So once you have done this, I will close um, the space claim. Um, working environment now. Um, now we are back um, at the uh, workbench work environment. And we are done with the, we define the engineering data. We are done with defining the geometry um, on the space claim working environment. Now we need to define our model in the mechanic, in, the, in another work environment called the mechanical work environment. So it's either you double click on this uh, model button here, or you right click on it. So I'm going to double click on it to open it. So this will load the mechanical um, work environment. You can see starting mechanical here. Yeah. So this can take like um, sometimes, say like a minute for the mechanical work environment to load. I'm going to pause it. Um, now we're in the mechanical ANSYS uh, work environment. Um, in this uh, work environment, in this interface, uh, we define um, the number and type of finite elements uh, by meshing. And we define um, the boundary condition, that is support condition, by specifying um, the support at node point where the su support is supposed to be located. And we also define the loads on the structural body. So on our left hand side, there's also a workflow under like under uh, model A4, we have geometry, material, cross section, coordinate system, connection. So you need to go to go through this workflow. So under the geometry, that's where you find the two finite elements which you define in the space claim and um, ANSYS working environment. So you see and uh, source one and it's source element one and source element two. You can see it's source element one. Um, you can check the property. The cross section area is 50 mm square. The cross element two, you check the property. The cross section area is 100 mm square. And you also see that model type, we change it in the space in the, sp in the space and uh, claim working environment to link source. And um, so you can also even change it here. Yeah. Say we don't want to want the element to be a source element, you can change it back to a beam element here. Yeah? But currently, it's 
defined as its source element. So what we can, what, what we are supposed to do here, that is very important, we are supposed to um, apply our material property to the element. So you do this in under the geometry, under this geometry workflow. So I'll select the first element. So under material assignments, material assignments, I'll click on the material I I created that I defined in the engineering data workflow. I define a new material as steel. So I, I select steel. So this applies steel to source element one. So I'll click on the second element and apply the same um, material um, which I created. So now I've applied my two materials um, to, to these elements and we see that the element is its source element. So we can move to the second tab. This, this material folder just shows um, the materials that are available for you to to be, to be used, the materials that are available to be used in your model. We have steel and we have the structural steel. This structural steel is available by default in the um, ANSYS um, program. Move to the cross section tab. Under the cross section, we have a um, two cross section which we, de which we define in the um, space claim um, ANSYS working environment. This rectangle is, um, the, is the cross section that is 50 mm square and rectangle 2 is the cross section that is 100 mm square so the coordinate system we only have one coordinate system in this model that is the xyz um, coordinate plane this coordinate this coordinate system here we can create other coordinate system to suit our need if we want just click on coordinate system right click insert new coordinate system and you you create it and you insert it Anyway, you want to insert it in this mechanical and this uh, work, 3D work environment. But I'm not creating any coordinate system, but I'm just showing you you can do that. This connection, uh, this the, this connection is is is, is, the, is a very important part of ANSYS. The connection is a very important part of ANSYS, as I've said. Unfortunately, I do not fully understand um, this aspect of ANSYS um, right now. This connection defines how, like, two materials, how they interact together at contact. Very, very important. But for this, um, our 1D problem is already checked as okay. We don't need to be concerned about the connection um, um, setting. So we move to mesh. Under the mesh, this is where we mesh our model. Um, our, to tell ANSYS that you want two linear finite elements. This is how I do it. My element one, the length is, uh, the length of my element one is a uh, 90 mm, and the length of my element two is a uh, 120 mm. So I use the greater volume so that the element is, so that the element will be meshed at, at, um, that at that particular at that particular size, 120 mm. If I use say if I, if I set this as 50, that means ANSYS is going to break this uh, this my element one into two parts, which I don't want. But since I use a very like a value 120, which is greater than 90, that means uh, ANSYS is my, although this element, this element one, which is 90 mm, is not up to uh, 120, ANSYS models this element as one finite element. So I use a bigger value than the element size, so that this element, like this element one, is modeled as um, one finite element. The other one is also modeled as another one finite element. So I have two linear finite elements. So that's why I specify 120 in the element size. Under the element um, control, you can define your element as a linear type. We've talked about this in my introduction video. I told you one dimensional uh, uh, analysis, finite, finite element analysis um, type. There are two types. We have a linear element and we have quadratic elements. So since um, we use linear element in our final element procedure on MATLAB and uh, on on MATLAB, 
I'm going to select um, the linear type. But I can select quadratic to get more accurate results. But I'm choosing linear because I want to compare this ANSYS result with um, the final element um, solution on MATLAB. So I'm done with the mesh. So after you have um, specified that setting in the mesh, you go to the static structure. In the static structure, this is where you define your boundary condition and you define your load on the structural body. So I will right click on the, to, to specify a boundary condition that is support. There is a support type in us is called um, displacement support. So I'm going to create that support and I will apply it at um, node one. So I click on the um, static structure in SAT. Um, displacement supports this like it like a type of support displacement support so I click on it so this gets added to it gets added under this static structural tree so I'll select on I'll select it and I need to apply this um, displacement support at node one so I need to select node one so there's a select tool around this place the, the vertex um, selection tool, I'll click on it and I will select node one. This is node one. So I've selected node one. I'll click on, I'm on displacement support. I want to apply the displacement support at this node. So once I'm on displacement support, you will see this um, table beneath. Under the geometry, I need to um, apply the support to the node. So I'll apply, I'll click on apply. So once I apply, you see this uh, yellow shape type comes up. This yellow shape denotes uh, the support at that point. So I need to um, restrain my, apply restrain at my support. So at, um, since the plane I, I use for my geometry is the XY plane, I'm going to restrain movement in the XY plane. As, at the X component, I'm going to enter zero mm um, I, I don't want any movement in the x direction zero in the y direction or enter zero in the z direction i don't need to specify any restraint because i'm i'm working in a, in a plane i'm not working in the z plane i'm working in the, in the xy plane but i can set it as zero but i'll leave it as free i'll leave it as free but i can put zero it will not affect um, my solution but I'm not going to put zero, so that you see that um, the not specifying it um, does not affect uh, your results. So I've, dis I've defined the displacement, the support at the boundary condition at um, node one. What next? We need to apply um, our point load at the end of the structural body, node three. <laughs> so what you need to do, you go to static structure, you right click, select insert, um, select force. As you did for the um, displacement support, we need to apply this uh, force we just created to the node at the end of the structural body. So I'll select node 3 and I will apply the force. So this red shape denotes um, the force at that point. So I want to define my, my force using component. I don't want to use vector form. I want to use component. So this comes up, tells me to define my force in the X, Y, and Z component. My force is in the X direction, is in the X global system, as you can see, X. So I will put a 160,000 Newton in that direction, four zeros, okay, correct. In the y and z the force the forces are zero so this is how i define the boundary condition and the loads on the structural body <laughs> um before we run analysis there's one more thing we need to do the structural body currently will be analyzed as a source element type if we don't change it to a one-dimensional element. So to do this, actually, at each node, node 1, node 2, node 3, we need to restrain 
movement in the y direction. That is just a simple trick. That means we need to apply displacement support in all the nodes and specify y, uh, y constraint as 0 mm. So this is what we need to do. At node 1, we already have a displacement constraint in the y direction at 0. So we need to create more displacement support, which we will apply at node 2 and node 3. So I'll create two more displacement supports. I'll create another one. So I've created two displacement support, displacement support two and displacement support three. So displacement support two, I'm going to select um, node two. This is node two, and I'll apply and I'll apply geometry, and I'm going to restrain the y component zero. I'll do the same thing for displacement three supports. I need to select node three. I will apply geometry. And I'll specify y constraint as zero. So now we have reduced 3D analysis type to a one-dimensional, to a one-D uh, analysis type analysis. Now, if I should run um, analysis by clicking on this, by clicking the solve button here, we will not have any error um, popping up. So I'm running analysis now. This can take some time, say like um, one minute or two minutes. So it's running, it's running, it is running. It's currently at 10%. 10% is shown here. Currently at 10%. Currently at 85%. Um, our analysis ran and it was successful. We know this because we have a green check in our solution. So now to see results, we need to specify, we need to tell us what we want to see. So we want the formation results. So under the solution three, Click on the solution, you right click, you insert deformation. You click on direction, directional deformation. Um, so this will, give, this will give us um, deformation in the x direction, which is what we wanted. Actually, this directional deformation, you can change the orientation, x, y, z, where it's at to x. We want deformation in the x direction, so we leave it at x. So what do we want again? Uh, we want to also see the reaction at the support. So we can specify that, click on solution, the solution um, three, right click, insert, go to probe, force reaction. So under the, under force reaction, and you need to select the boundary condition, that is the support which we've created, the support where you want the reaction to be found. We have several supports in this question. We have displacement, displacement two, displacement three, which is the support at node one, node two, node three. We also have a weak, weak, weak spring. Actually, uh, ANSYS actually uh, put some weak su some support. I don't know how it works in the model for us, uh, maybe for stability and all that. So the support at node one is the displacement boundary condition. So I'll click on displacement. So you see, um, the, for, the this label shows um, the probe at um, node node one, which will read um, the reaction at um, this node. When I click on solve to run um, to run analysis to show me my results. Also, we want to also see the area um, force in each of the elements. So we click on the solution tree insert, and we click on uh, under the beam result area force. Don't specify anything here. So, unfortunately, these are the three by default. These are the three results we can display using ANSYS for one dimensional element. However, I think there are other means. There are one. There's one important result which we cannot display here. That is the normal stress. 
but have, you can actually def, um, which is normal stress but I think there are other ways of doing it uh, which I don't know about but by default this is what is available on ANSYS the normal stress is not available in the it's not, it's not available anywhere here so uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to run so that this result should be this, this three results will be displayed I'll click this solve button here. So when I click the solve button, you can see the, the green tick for each of them. The actual information, if you have false, false reaction, they are all ticked green. So I'll click on the direction deformation now. So we see the color plot for the direction deformation in the X direction. So this is the deformation in the X direction. You can see the blue, many blue at the at node one, meaning we have zero displacement at zero one. We see the red at the end, meaning we have 2.4 mm. The unit for deformation is in millimeter, 2.4 mm deformation at the end of the member. I will show this result using probe. Click on the result tab, um, click on probe, probe, click on sna uh, snap, check the snap box and click this end region. You can see the deformation is 2.4 here. At the intersection of the two material type, of the two parts, you see the deformation is uh, 1.44, which is the same thing with our ANSYS uh, finite element uh, um, solution on MATLAB. At the end of the at node 1, you can see the deformation is 0. You can also place probe along the element at other points but I need to uncheck this snap um, box so you say at the center here you see the at this point somewhere at the center here the deformation is around 0 0.62589 mm somewhere here the deformation is um 1.8447 mm from this uh, support location so this is, the this is the color plot for the deformation in the X direction. For the reaction, you can see the reaction pointing um, in the opposite direction to our 160 kN at node 3. And to check, to see this, to see the value of this reaction vector, this force, you check it under here, under this, under this uh, table here. You see that in the X direction, the force is minus 1.6 times 10 to the 5 newton. In the y direction, we see a very, 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 very small force. 1.999 um, times 10 to the power minus 11. Times 10 to the power minus 11. So it shows you that we're supposed to get zero in the y direction. It, sh it shows you that finite element procedure. It shows you that an ANSYS uh, program uses finite element uh, procedure in this analysis for you to get this um, oppose, this approximate answer why is supposed to give us zero but well, we are getting a very 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 very, very small value but the value of the reaction is minus 1.6 times 10 to the power 5 newton so this is the reaction force at node 1 for the um, area force for the area force we see that the area force in both material is uh, 1.6 times 10 to the power 5 newton the unit is a Newton. You see the unit here, the area force. Um, let me view this in the Z direction. So I can probe this. I can also place probe on it. You see the force is a 1.6 times 10 to the power 5 Newton. The force in this material is a 1.6. I'm on snap. The, the, the force everywhere is. Uh, in the material is 1.6 times 10 to the power 5 newton. So this is how we solve um, one-dimensional um, li linear finite element using the ANSYS um, um, program. Um, before I end this video, I would like to recommend a YouTube channel to you guys where you can learn about how to model a one, 1D, 2D, 3D body on space claim um, ANSYS working environment. This is an ANSYS um, YouTube channel. Um, the link uh, to the YouTube video 
will be in the link um, of this video. So don't forget to check it uh, to learn how to model um, body uh, structure uh, on ANSYS uh, using a uh, space claim. Um, in my next video, I'm going to solve this problem uh, also using a finite element procedure um, by elimination methods. And I'm going to show the hand calculation for this type of problem. So stay tuned and watch out for my um, next video. I'm very grateful for watching uh, my YouTube video. Thank you so much. Have a nice day.